Okay, here's a really interesting question that I've had from some viewers, which is what are the limitations of medical research? Hello everyone, my name is Ollie. I'm a second year medical student at the University of Warwick. So today we're talking about the limitations of medical research. I think in any of these more abstract questions, usually it's a good idea to start by defining our terms. So what do we mean by research? Research, or at least scientific research, is a systematic approach to either discover new facts, answer particular questions, or get rid of existing facts and then replacing them with new ones. So just to give an example, in the medical setting, this might mean something like, we want to test this particular drug to see whether it reduces the risk of heart attacks. So we'll take a big group of people, we'll give half of them our special new drug, half of them a placebo or a control, and then if our new drug group has substantially fewer heart attacks than the control group, that suggests, all other things being the same, that that drug played a part in reducing the incidence of heart attacks. That would be seen as good evidence that that drug works. And that sounds great, obviously, we want to do as much research as possible to get new technologies, to make new medical advances, get better treatments for everyone, but it is not a perfect process. So firstly, something that tends to be really, really obvious when you're looking at large-scale studies is that most medical research trials favour certain types of population. What typically happens, particularly in the Western world, even across these large multi-centre studies, is that they tend to favour Caucasian populations just because statistically they represent the largest kind of group in each of the catchment areas. That's no one's fault necessarily, it's just a kind of artifact of geographical history. But what that does mean is that the ensuing data that you get from that study will conform better to the Caucasian population than it will to ethnic minorities, for example. And that might have negative health outcomes for those other populations as a result, because the data has less predictive value about the health of those individuals. Another thing you might wish to consider is that medical research in the UK, as well as in many other countries internationally, is constrained by ethical review boards, who are in theory always impartial, disinterested third parties who kind of set the guidelines as to what is and what isn't considered ethically permissible. So just for an example, at the moment I'm conducting my own research, which has required looking at um, cervical spine CT scans. So when patients have come in to have an operation on the spine that runs through their neck, they've had a CT scan, a radiological investigation done such that the surgeons can see what's going on on the inside. For my research, I've then had to have a look at many of these scans and then take some anatomical measurements. And even something like this, where my research doesn't involve me interacting directly with patients in any way, has still had to go through an ethical review. I've had to specify, you know, how many scans I want, whose scans I'm going to be looking at, what precisely am I going to be doing with them, what am I going to be measuring, what am I going to be using that data for, what's the value of what I'm doing, and how am I storing that sensitive information while I've got hold of it, how am I accessing it. So there are many, many things that you have to consider when doing medical research, and that obviously makes a huge number of potential roadblocks on which a study can just fall through. You're also not allowed in most cases to design an experiment in which there's a, a good likelihood that some of the participants will come to actual harm. So you can't, just to think of a couple of examples, replace someone's chemotherapy with a placebo because they're likely to come to harm as a result of you doing that. Nor could you go and get a sample group of 20 people and break all their arms in order to fix them using some new kind of surgery. Things like that do cross the line. Do note, however, that this isn't necessarily the case everywhere. There was a case fairly recently in China where there was a scientist who used the CRISPR gene editing tool to edit some human embryos, which will then obviously be born into genetically modified humans. And the reason I use China as an example is that it, it's one of the notorious places internationally where they have next to no ethical review over medical experiments, which, you know, on the one hand, it lets them do these kind of crazy, massive, groundbreaking experiments where they might make huge leaps forward in their scientific and technological understanding. And that comes purely from that lack of ethical constraint. But then at what cost? Obviously, what effect do these experiments have 
on the society more widely. We've got to be really careful when making these considerations. Research is also really intensive in terms of resources and time. You've got to pay for people's staff, you've got to hire lab space, get the materials you'll use in the experiments, maybe pay participants, pay people to analyze and collect the data, and then you've got to pay to publish your findings in a journal. So particularly very large scale research projects need huge amount of money behind them, but then this creates a problem. The organization or the entity that holds most of the money is therefore gonna drive your research in particular directions to answer questions that they want answering. So just to think of a couple of examples, the NHS has a finite pool of money that it can allocate to research funding. So it's got to answer the kind of big questions that it thinks are gonna benefit the most patients. And that'll be decided by various review boards and experts in the field. But then in the private sector, you can look at commercial brands. Obviously they have huge R&D budgets but you've got to watch them because they're also notorious for funding studies that tend to have very positive findings about their products. So always, always when you're reading medical and health research, particularly in areas like nutrition, always maintain a skeptical eye. And equally on that front, people do not publish their negative findings, which is just it's a huge problem. The thing is, practically speaking, no one cares if an experiment doesn't turn up good results because that's not exciting. No one wants to put money, time into advertising, things like that, publishing them, taking up space in print journals. What people want are the latest, greatest, massive breakthroughs. So only positive finding studies tend to be published. So obviously that means that we all don't hear about the things that don't work. Another issue, unfortunately, that I've become particularly aware of in the medical sphere is that a lot of the research is simply of very poor quality. And I have a theory as to why that is. It's because at least one, and I have a theory as to at least one of the contributing factors to this. Essentially, because publishing research, either as a medical student or a low grade trainee before you go into your specialty applications, Doing research is worth points, right, when it comes to applying for those specialties. So this leads to a bit of a, a publish or perish mentality, as it's called. You, you have to publish, you have to be seen doing research, particularly if you want to go down a sort of more academic career path. So then naturally what this is going to lead to is people publishing via the easiest means possible because in a system that favors people who churn out more research papers, that's obviously what's gonna happen. Because all that matters to those people at the end of the day is that the tick box on their application form is getting checked. It doesn't matter the nature of what they did or the quality of the findings or where they published it. As long as you have a tick box to check just for having done research, of course you're gonna pick the easiest thing. You'd be an idiot not to. So the outcomes of the studies for the people doing it and the patients that might be benefited by more high quality studies, it all just becomes completely inconsequential. And the last point I want to make is, is a bit more abstract, but it, it goes along with the point I'm about to make, which is that research of all varieties is going to tend to favor the types of studies that are easy to measure the variables that are changing instead of things that are more abstract. Just to give an example of what I mean by that is that it's much easier, for example, to measure how many people say die of cancer in any given six month period because you're just measuring a very easy, discrete variable. It would be much more difficult, for example, to measure the people's quality of life, what their priorities, what their thoughts were, how did their health attitudes change, particularly towards their death maybe, that sort of qualitative information that it might be really useful to know in informing future care, because that's much harder to measure going on with everything we've said before, more complex studies, there are fewer people motivated to do them, there'll be less funding for them because they're a lot more expensive and time intensive to do, and they're more difficult to set targets around, those more difficult studies don't get done, even though they might be more valuable to everyone involved in the long term. So those are just a few of my thoughts, guys, on the limitations of medical research. If I was going into an interview, those are what I would kind of come up with off the top of my head. There are loads and loads of limitations of medical research. And if you've got any more, I would love to hear from you in the comments below with your permission. I will add them to the online article version of this video. Every video has a 
um, a full document that goes along with it so you can get all the most important points easily. So if you'd like to contribute to any of the videos I've made, we can put them all online so everyone can read them. I'd be really appreciative of that. So thanks very much for watching guys, please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, go and check out postgradmedic.com for more free videos like this, interviews with existing medical students, health professionals and tips on getting you into medical school. Take care and I'll see you next time.